Good morning. Um, can you all hear? Yeah? The back there? No problems? Can you all hear? Yep. Um, thanks for turning up early on a Sunday morning. It's always a ta hard task for anybody, especially me, like all the way from Cronulla. Don't get up this side very much. I don't like you up here. <laughs> um, my, my job today, and I, I guess most of you, oh, Con, you're a god. Green tea. Not the god, but one of the minor ones. There you go. Thanks, mate. Cross Cheers. Country. Cheers. Um, my job today is to give you a brief overview of just the field that I've been working in and, and maybe an update of how stem cell therapies are happening in the human side of things. Anyone here had any experience in this field at all? Excellent. <laughs> all right, so uh, you have not. Put your hand down. Okay, so um, first of all, I'll, I'll just give you a bit of background on, on me and what I, what I do. Um, for the last four or five years, um, since I finished my embryonic stem cell training at Monash University, I've been working with my group at uh, St. George Animal Hospital, mainly in the, the canine model, um, looking at, at the aging process and how stem cells fit into that, um, that area. Um, when you consider the world's population at the moment and the demographics of how we're moving ahead here, and within the next 10 years, how many people will be over the age of 65? and how many young people will be left to support those old timers. Um, these sort of things, stem cell therapies and regenerative medicine, have taken on a, a big push, not just here but in the States. And every time you seem to pick up a paper or turn on the TV, you see stuff on regenerative medicine. Anyone here see that program last week, SPS, at all, on stem cell therapies? No interest in this at all? Great. Okay. Okay. So, um, with the advent of biotechnology, um, our ability to, to manage cells at that cellular level, at the molecular level, is growing in leaps and bounds. And so this will happen um, a lot faster over the next um, three to four years, I guess, when you consider what's happening in the US now. Since the administration in the US changed from the old guy, the previous guy, um, to the new administration, the National Institute of Health over there is pouring literally billions of dollars into this biotechnology area. And things are happening um, almost on a weekly basis. Um, things have come a long way since a guy called Leroy Stevens actually um, discovered and named stem cells in 1950. Um, it's a long, long time ago. And stem cell therapies and transplants have been taking place since the 1960s. But we've known them by another name. We've known them by the name of bone marrow transplants. Bone marrow transplants um, occur commonly in people who have had leukemia, had radiation therapy and their bone marrow wiped out and then been transplanted with new bone marrow, which is basically stem cells, and stem cells regrow them. So they were the first um, stem cell therapies. Um, the other thing that's happened in the last 10 years is that the advent of the internet, I mean, everyone here uses Google, I'm sure. I mean, th there's a verb called Google now. I mean, who would have thought that, you know, when you say, well, Google that, you know, no one would know what that was 10 years ago. But with the advent of of um, the internet, discoveries that take place uh, are immediately around the world. Uh, they're on Yahoo, they're on Google, they're on Facebook. It's instantaneous communication. And from a scientific point of view, the guys that we work with in the US can communicate with us instantaneously and we can look at their work online quite quickly. So the advent of the internet has pushed this field Let's and look at, first of all, um, the potential of stem cells. You can see as you look around the human body, basically if there's a place in the body, there's a stem cell therapy for it. You can pick up an awful lot of diseases from baldness at the top of your head to diabetic ulcers on your feet that can be treated with stem cell therapies and actually have been treated with stem cell therapies. Things like spinal cord injuries and osteoarthritis, which we do a lot of now, wound healing, regeneration of even teeth, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, cancers. I mean, stem cell therapies have enormous potential, enormous potential. And by the end of this talk today, I hope that you'll have a better idea of, of um, what we're using, the ethical concerns, the moral aspects of it, um, and just how, how close we are to, to what we're, we're doing now. Um, as these therapies um, develop, the demand for them um, with people will, will also begin to increase. This next slide shows you um, stem cell therapy sales, for want of a better word, and you can see that um, it's been extrapolated out here to 2016 here with an $8.5 billion market. 
this drives therapies. Money drives everything. But stem cell therapies are, are driven by, as you have all heard, there are a lot of desperate people around. And you can pick up stem cell therapies in third non-first world countries, um, India, the Philippines, Thailand, you name it. You can go there and you can get stem cell therapies. Whether they're reputable and trialled is another question. But now they begin to appear in first world countries as well. And this graph begins to show you, and if you look at the curve here, it's basically not a straight line curve. It's an exponential curve, which means that in a straight line curve obviously would go like that. And that means you add on a factor, the same factor with every step. With this one, you multiply it by every step. So it's times two times two times two times two. And as you see, this exponentiality of it, you can apply that curve to just about anything you like. For instance, mobile phone uptake. If you graph that, you get the same sort of exponential curve. And the point on that curve where it starts to go vertical like that is where we're approaching now. OK. So the, the uses of stem cells, what you normally see is, and hear is stem cell therapies making miraculous recoveries for people who couldn't walk before, couldn't see before, whatever. But stem cell therapies actually have three different areas that are, that are just as important as each other. The bottom one here shows you that the tissues that you can generate from stem cells. But over here, we, we have the ability to use these stem cells in the lab to test drugs and do toxicity testing, which is currently done on live animals, which no one really wants to do. Rabbits and mice, and who want to be a lab rat? Over here, we also have the ability over here to study disease processes as they develop at the cellular level. For instance, if we can, and you'll understand a bit, a bit more about this as we go on further, but you can take stem cells from someone with a genetic disease, such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, and you can watch these cells develop in the lab, and you can watch this disease taking hold at a cellular and molecular level. We can watch this happening, and that's the first time we've had this ability to, to do that stuff. So there are three main areas that stem cells can actually help us in. Um, as you know, um, Parkinson's is probably the, the disease du jour as far as stem cell therapy goes. There are a lot of famous people. Michael Fox is, is one of them, who was the spokesman. I had a privilege of meeting him in New York last year. I also was, was um, very privileged to meet some... Um, God. Superman. Christopher Reeve. God. Sorry, Chris. Uh, I met him when he was down in Sydney, and, and, you know, a fabulous guy. And I would have loved to see Chris walk again. Um, fortunately, that didn't happen. But these sort of guys push this sort of therapy into the mainstream, and people listen to them and watch them on TV, and they donate money to them. They were pretty much hamstrung by government's inability to move. But, but these guys drove this field. So basically, you know, when you see someone with Parkinson's disease, and I have friends with this condition, a good example of this side of things is that you watch these cells begin to fail to develop the ability to generate dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter in the brain, which allows you to move properly. And Parkinson's people have that sort of inability. And as these cells develop this, we can track the genes turning on and turning off now, and this will give us, the, hopefully, the ability to actually interfere with this process. And stem cells are uniquely available for that sort of thing, as you'll see in a second here. Okay, so let's look at stem cells in general, what they are, where they come from, what they do, and how they do it. So there were, and I stress the word were, two kinds of stem cells, and you would probably know this in general terms. There were embryonic stem cells, and there were adult stem cells. And they're differentiated because of their ability to differentiate. Embryonic stem cells are the ones that are called pluripotent. Now, pluripotent means, oh, late come up. Pluripotent cells are the ones that can generate any cell in your body, which are what embryonic stem cells can do. <coughs> Excuse me. Adult stem cells have a, a similar ability, but can't differentiate into every cell type in your body. Now, embryonic stem cells, um, from this slide, y you can see this is the main problem with them. They have great advantages and, and a big disadvantage. They are this little blue group here. This thing here is a blastocyst, and it's the embryo at about four to eight days of age. And that little blue lot there is called the inner cell mass. And they are embryonic stem cells. And once you get them out, 
and you can, you can then challenge them with different environments in the lab, they can turn into heart cells or nerve cells or skin cells or whatever. But they have the ability to actually become most cells in the body. Now that's, that's a unique ability for, um, for a cell. Um, they come with, unfortunately, a controversial problem, which we all have heard about. This is an embryo. You take that out of that embryo and you destroy that embryo. So there's a lot of kerfuffle about that, or there was. Um, Um, they're different kinds. Embolical stem cells are a different one altogether. They're a little further down the tree, all right? But we'll get to that in a sec. Um, so there's a bit of a hot topic about this stuff, and you're caught between a rock and a hard place. And this probably sums up the whole thing. There's two sides to the argument. We're not going to get into this, but this, this cartoon has, has basically doesn't mean a great deal anymore, and I'll tell you why in a second. Because embryonic stem cells have been superseded now by a new one. So, um, what happened with, um, in, in sort of two years ago, the Japanese um, developed a cell called an IPS cell, an induced pluripotent stem cell. Now, what that meant was, if you look at this side of the, the slide here, this is therapeutic cloning. Therapeutic cloning means that you take an egg cell here, you remove its nucleus, you take a body cell, usually a fibroblast from the skin, and you take the nucleus out. You then put this nucleus into the empty egg. This then is then stimulated by a little electrical shock and it begins to divide into an embryo. And then you get your stem cells out of that. Basically, same problem. Embryos die when you do that. These guys in Japan took skin cells, a fibroblast from somebody. They then added four genetic transcription factors and these cells reversed in time to become embryonic stem cells. Now, what that meant was, is that, obviously, no more embryos being destroyed, which made a lot of people happy. Um, and it meant that we then had a, a source of stem cells that, that were basically embryonic, that could generate any tissue in your body, that we could play with in the lab. And they actually were an exact genetic replica of the person they came from. The Americans, two years later, didn't put four transcription factors in. They put two small molecules in, did the same thing. This was a gigantic step forward. Um, the biggest problem with stem cell therapies is that it's very difficult to find a cell with the right potential of differentiating all the tissues and to avoid destruction by the immune system you put it into. So I can't take your cells and put it into me because my immune system would go, well, that's not mine, and destroy it. This time round, I can take your skin cells and I can turn them into embryonic stem cells, and you have your own supply, personal embryonic stem cells, which will then be compatible with you. So you can see what a giant step forward this was. And it made such a huge difference. The whole field had a paradigm shift. It went from, let's talk about destruction of embryos, till, you know, the cows come home, and then start moving along this. And all those research areas we talked about before in the previous slide also took a big step forward. So, um, this one here basically shows you, you take the skin cells from the patient, you introduce the stem cell genes, or you treat with the small molecules, isolate the cells here, and then grow them up. And you can differentiate them as you please. So, yeah, Tell pretty big step on IPS one. cells, and what their potential is, and what's happening now. Any of you that saw the SBS program the other day would have seen three people with incurable disease. And all these people then went down the path of looking at what's happening for stem cells. One guy had a cardiac problem, that he needed a new heart for. Um, if I have embryonic stem cells, let's say IPS cells, let's say, let's pick somebody. Who wants to have a heart problem? You. So this gentleman here in the red shirt has a failing heart, OK? He's going to die um, without a heart transplant. He's on the list. And he waits and waits and waits and waits. And probably he won't make it, because there's only about 10%.